From New York, this is Democracy Now! They don't fall in to rescue the, the people. They, they, tell, uh, they tell always uh, human rights. Uh, because they, they have the black hair, or the, they don't have the green or blue eyes, they didn't rescue these people. The death toll in Italy has reached 67 after a boat carrying up to 200 refugees in Europe fell apart over the weekend. At least 16 of the victims were children. The shipwreck came just days after the Italian government seized a rescue boat operated by Doctors Without Borders. We'll speak with NSF about the tragedy in Italy's crackdown on humanitarian groups. Then to the student debt crisis. Conservative justices on the Supreme Court appear set to block President Biden from eliminating or reducing student loan debt for millions of borrowers. As the court heard oral arguments, student debt activists and lawmakers rallied outside the Supreme Court. Is it just for us to look at the problem of student debt through a racial justice lens? Yes. Is it just for us to look at the student debt crisis as an economic problem in this country? Yeah. Plus, we go to Alabama, where hundreds of striking miners are returning to work at the Warrior Met Coal Company this week after nearly two years on the picket line. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The Supreme Court heard oral arguments Tuesday in two challenges to the Biden administration's student debt relief plan, which could give tens of millions of federal borrowers up to $20,000 of relief each. Several conservative justices expressed skepticism over the plan, while liberal justice Sonia Sotomayor blasted the Republican states that brought one of the lawsuits arguing 50 million students will suffer if the program is rescinded, and that the Education Department should be making decisions about how to handle their debt rather than judges. Activists gathered outside the court. This is Maddie Clifford of The Debt Collective. The same billionaires and corporations that don't want you to have higher wages, that want to bust your unions, that don't want you to have decent and free medical care, that want to dictate what you do with your body, that want more tax cuts for the super rich, they're the ones that also want you to stay neck deep in student debt. Later in the show, we'll speak with debt collective organizer and writer Eleni Shermer. Elsewhere in Washington, D.C., the Senate Judiciary Committee held a hearing Tuesday for the Equal Rights Amendment, which would codify gender equality in the Constitution. The ERA was passed in 1972, but was never ratified, as conservative opponents have argued the deadline for ratification is passed. The ERA would not only help address persistent inequality in areas like wages, it could also protect abortion rights and the rights of trans and non-binary people. Constitutional and legal experts say Congress has the authority to change the ratification timeline. This is lawyer and constitutional scholar Kathleen Sullivan speaking at yesterday's hearing. It's my belief that under Article 5, Congress proposed it, 38 states ratified it. It is the law now, and the only thing standing away, standing in the way, is the congressional deadline which Congress set in 1972, altered in 1978, and has the power to change today. Tuesday's hearing came as Washington, D.C. Circuit Court struck down a case which would have compelled the U.S. archivist to publish and certify the Equal Rights Amendment as part of the Constitution. In Nigeria, Bola Tinubu of the ruling All Progressives Congress Party was declared the winner of the weekend's presidential election, but his opponents have disputed the results, alleging fraud, while election observers and voters have cited delays, closures and violence at voting sites. Turnout was less than 30 percent. Tinubu, the former governor of Lagos, lost the vote in Lagos state to the Labour Party's Peter Obi, who came in third overall. Obi had received much of his support from young voters, who saw him as the candidate of change. Atiku Abubakar of the main opposition party, People's Democratic Party, received the second-highest number of votes, according to Nigeria's Electoral Commission. The new president of Africa's most populous nation will have to face the ongoing security and violence 
finance crisis, as well as double-digit inflation and unprecedented oil theft. Iranian authorities say they're investigating after a series of poisonings at girls' schools. The latest such attack struck a school in the city of Pardis, in Tehran province, Tuesday. Nearly 700 schoolgirls have suffered toxic poisoning since November, and what authorities have said is an attempt to shut down education for girls and could be linked to the nationwide women's rights protests in Iran that took off in September following the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini in police custody. Custody. No students have been killed in the attacks, but many have reported respiratory problems and other health effects. Back in the United States, President Biden's top deputy secretary of labor, Julie Su, to be the next labor secretary, as former Boston Mayor Marty Walsh leaves his post this month to head the National Hockey League's Players Union. The nomination of Su, a civil rights attorney and former head of California's Labor Department, was welcomed by progressive and pro-labor groups. She would be the first Asian American to serve as secretary in Biden's cabinet. Amy Allison, founder of She the People, said, quote, Julie Su's commitment to ensuring equity and compliance to her work as a labor expert and attorney fighting for the rights of women workers nationally makes her the ideal choice to lead the Labor Department. We'll have more on this story later in the broadcast. Meanwhile, Democrats reintroduced the PRO Act Tuesday for the third time. The legislation would protect the right to organize and penalize companies who engage in union busting. This is Senator Bernie Sanders. Under this bill, it will no longer be cheaper for corporations to break the law than to obey the law. At a time when we are seeing, and here's good news, more and more workers wanting to join unions, it is unacceptable that over half of workers who vote to form a union don't have a union contract a year after their union victory. That will change under the PRO Act. In Mississippi, Republican Governor Tate Reeves has signed into law a bill that bans gender-affirming health care for transgender youth. The legislation criminalizes providing transition-related care to minors, frees health insurance companies from having to cover gender-affirming care for youth, and blocks public funding for clinics and institutions that offer this type of care. Mississippi is at least the fifth state in the United States to ban health care for trans youth. In just the past month, Utah and South Dakota enacted trans health care bans, and the Oklahoma House just passed a similar measure. Two other bans in Alabama and Arkansas are currently being challenged in federal court. In Arkansas, the legislature has also voted to advance a bill that criminalizes trans adults for using public restrooms when children are present. In Tennessee, Republican Governor Bill Lee is facing backlash after a high school photo of him dressed in drag went viral just days after he said he plans to sign a bill that criminalizes drag performances. The measure bans drag shows from being performed in public or in front of children. Nationwide, at least 14 bills have been introduced, including in Arizona, Texas and Tennessee, targeting drag shows, with performers and supporters saying these measures have worsened harassment and threats from far-right groups. Several drag storytime events for kids at libraries and other public places have been targeted by right-wing groups, including armed protesters. Some 30 million people across the United States are seeing a portion of their federal food assistance taken away today. The Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, had increased benefits as part of the emergency response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Some households could lose hundreds of dollars each month, even as families continue to face increased food prices, and analysts warn the cuts will bring millions to a hunger cliff. Congress member Pramila Jayapal said, quote, it's unacceptable. Poverty and hunger are policy choices. It's time we step up and do more, she said. And in Chicago, Mayor Lori Lightfoot conceded Tuesday evening after losing her bid for re-election. An April 4th runoff will pit Paul Vallis, the former superintendent of Chicago Public Schools, who's backed by the Fraternal Order of Police, and progressive Brandon Johnson, a Cook County commissioner and organizer for the Chicago Teachers Union. This is Paul Vallis speaking to supporters last night. We will have a safe Chicago. We will make Chicago the safest city in America. Yeah! 
In Chicago's election, Paul Vallis received about 34 percent of the vote. Brandon Johnson placed second with just over 20 percent. On Tuesday night, Johnson criticized Vallis's record. He is backed by the same forces who have done nothing as crime has paralyzed our city. He's backed by the same supporters who have failed to enforce the consent decree, even after Adam Toledo, Laquan McDonald were, were killed. Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot placed third in Tuesday's race. Four years ago, she became the first black woman and openly gay Chicago mayor. But she came under intense criticism during her term, including for her handling of the pandemic, racial justice protests, the Chicago teachers strike, crime levels and skyrocketing property taxes. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in Chicago. Hi, Juan. It... Hi, Amy. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, you're there in Chicago, where this race took place yesterday for the mayor of Chicago. A lot of firsts. Um, you know, you had Lori Lightfoot, who was the first African American woman mayor of Chicago, the first openly LGBTQ mayor of Chicago, and now she becomes the first incumbent mayor to go down in what something like 40 years. Can you talk about the Vallis versus Johnson runoff and the significance of what took place? Yes, Amy. Well, Lori Lightfoot was deeply unpopular, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, uh, her first term was uh, less than stellar, I think, for most voters felt. Uh, but this is shaping up now. The runoff on April 4th is shaping up to be a sort of classic battle between uh, progressives on, uh, on the one hand and centrist and conservative forces in Chicago on the other. Uh, 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 Paul Vallis is a former CEO, not only of the Chicago Public Schools, he was also, uh, he had a stint as superintendent of the Philadelphia Public Schools, as well as in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Uh, he's a big backer of charter schools, and obviously that is a major issue that the Chicago Teachers Union, from which Brandon Johnson emerges, uh, is deeply opposed to. Uh, and uh, he's also had significant backing from real estate and business leaders. Uh, and, um, uh, and his main issue, really, uh, or as some people say his main three issues were crime, crime and crime. Uh, he, he promised uh, he's promising more police officers uh, on the streets. Uh, he touted in uh, last night uh, in his uh, election night speech that not only is his wife a police officer, uh, his uh, one of his sons is a police officer and others a firefighter. Uh, and he clearly is seeking the uh, the uh, more conservative votes, uh, not only in, among centrist Democrats, uh, but also among those who consider themselves Republicans. Uh, in Chicago. Uh, and uh, Brandon Johnson, on the other hand, uh, was strongly backed by uh, several key labor unions, not only his own local, the Chicago Teachers Union and the Working Families Party, but the, uh, the American Federation of Teachers, the parent union of CTU, poured in lots of money as well, as did uh, the Service Employees International Un uh, Union, the health care division. Uh, so this is basically key labor unions were backing Brandon Johnson as well as progressives, uh, and he was emphasizing that you you fight uh, crime as well by investing in communities and in uh, alternatives for young people. So it's really shaping up to be a classic uh, progressive versus conservative battle. Uh, the problem is that uh, uh, that Vallis did get 34 percent of the vote, and so Brandon Johnson is going to have to really be able to get backing from a. A lot of the others who lost, including uh, Congressman Chewy Garcia, who came in fourth with 14 percent, what, what Lightfoot is going to do and her supporters are going to do is going to be critical. So it's going to be a tough race uh, between now and April 4th to see which vision of urban, uh, urban governance uh, wins out. And do you see this as a message to the country and to Democrats? Because this is actually a battle within the Democratic Party, um, the police union versus the teachers union in Chicago. 
Yes, well, I mean, it, it is because Chicago is such an important city uh, in the nation, but we've been seeing this now play out in a lot of uh, urban races where a, a wing of the Democratic Party uh, finds itself some, to some degree more in, um, uh, in sync uh, with uh, some views of some independents and conservatives uh, around, uh, once again, uh, tr putting the emphasis on fighting crime rather than trying to deal with the conditions that give rise to crime uh, and uh, with the, the social safety nets of, of urban cities. So we're going to be seeing this play out all, over and over again. And Chicago could be a bellwether as to how will, this will develop in the future. Well, we'll continue, of course, to follow this. The runoff election is April 4th. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez as we turn now to the death toll in Italy, reaching 67, after a boat carrying up to 200 people seeking refuge in Europe fell apart over the weekend near the Italian city of Cortone. At least 16 of the victims were children. Around 80 survivors were pulled to safety after they were found in the water, clinging to pieces of the ship which had departed the Turkish city of Izmir a few days earlier. Some of the survivors are children who lost their whole families in the shipwreck. Rescuers said many of the passengers were from Afghanistan. Others came from Iran, from Syria and from Somalia. On Tuesday, some relatives of the victims went to a sports hall in Cortone to identify the bodies of their loved ones. The pol police show us a uh, uh, picture and say, Do you, uh, it's your family, and we should uh, to give answer for yes or not. And, and did you recognize say, them? Yes. Yes. And what did you think when you saw them? Uh, what should you think? It's happened. It's happened. It's on my now. Okay. I have two, two daughters. So my child of five years is lost. Another relative of the victims questioned why more wasn't done to save the passengers on the boat. They don't fall in to rescue the, the people. They. They tell, uh, they tell always uh, human right uh, because they they have the black hair or the, they don't have the green or blue eyes. They didn't rescue these people. I don't know the all the people they tell telling uh, about the human right because they have the black eye or black hair. They they weren't they weren't uh, human. Since 2014, almost 26,000 people have died or gone missing in the Mediterranean, but many governments have responded by criminalizing rescue efforts by humanitarian groups. Just days before the shipwreck off the coast of Italy, the Italian government of the far-right leader, Giorgia Maloney, approved a new law making it harder for humanitarian aid rescue vessels to carry out their missions. Doctors Without Borders, MSF, said their rescue ship was detained by Italian authorities just last week as part of the new measures, blocking it from going to sea to save lives for at least 20 days. We're going now to Brussels, to Belgium, uh, to speak with Caroline Willemann. She is de deputy head of mission for search and rescue at Médecins Sans Frontières. That's Doctors Without Borders. Um, Caroline, welcome to Democracy Now!, this horror at sea. And your ship uh, basically uh, confiscated, detained by the Italian government. Explain everything that took place. Um, yeah, indeed. So it's an, an, an extremely, extremely cynical situation, and I can only um, follow the words uh, that the person was speaking earlier of, of where do we see our right to speak about human rights. Um, so indeed, on Thursday evening, our ship um, was informed by the Italian authorities that we will be detained uh, for a period of 20 days. Uh, we will not be able to carry out um, our life-saving word, which is indeed a result um, of this new legislation that was put in place uh, by the Italian authorities. Um, 
um, and, and the detention actually is only part of already uh, the way that this legislation is reducing our capacity to, to carry out rescues. We are now also forced uh, to return to port as soon after one rescue, um, which means that we can rescue much less people um, every time that we go out to rescue people. Um, so just to give you an idea, we before this legislation, we used to rescue on average, we used to do more than four rescues and rescue um, over 280 people each time, while now we're allowed to do only one rescue, which might be 50 people up to 100 people. Um, and, and the question is, of course, where, where are those people who are not rescued um, by us? So indeed, our, our work is being blocked. Um, while unfortunately these these horrendous tragedies uh, keep happening, um, I want to make clear as well that there is a lot more media attention in this case because the um, the tragedy happens so close to Italy. Um, but this is something that happens on a on quite unfortunately regular basis. Also, very often closer, for example, to the Libyan coast of people leaving leaving the Libyan shores, and very often that news will not even reach um, Western media. Could you talk about the uh, anti-refugee and anti-immigrant policies being enforced by EU nations like Italy, uh, especially given the fact that right now many of these same European com countries are opening their doors to uh, refugees from the, uh, the war in Ukraine, and yet they're increasingly shutting the doors uh, to, the, uh, to refugees from the global south? Exactly. I think uh, what is what we've seen in the past year in terms of the welcoming of um, refugees fleeing Ukraine, to be very clear, which is exactly what we should be doing. Um, and that is exactly the welcome that anybody uh, fleeing persecution, fleeing war um, deserves, um, according, I mean... I don't even want to want to mention uh, what, what I might want to believe in, in, in the little humanity that we have left um, to, to receive people, to welcome people, but also according to international law. Um, it's, it's not solely a, a humanitarian um, imperative, um, let's say. And so indeed what we've seen over the past year also shows that it is not a matter of, of it not being possible. It's a matter of lack of political will um, because the, the the open doors policy, again, so very rightly ap applied uh, to people fleeing Ukraine, um, has not been applied to people fleeing um, from, from other countries. And so it, it has been several years um, that in Italy, amongst other countries um, in Europe. Indeed, the work of, of NGOs is, has been made uh, more difficult in in. Um, previous years, there has been criminalization of individuals working for NGOs. Uh, we've had to face um, discriminative practices of port state controls. Um, so in itself, no issue with a port state control. In itself, no issue with, let's say, also COVID quarantine measures. Uh, we are a medical organization. Of course, we support um, medical quarantine measures when they make sense. Um, but you have to ask yourself some questions when measures are being applied much more strictly uh, for search and rescue NGOs than for others. And so this is what we see now as well in this new legislation that has come out that targets only NGOs doing search and rescue work. Uh, keep in mind that the vast majority of people who arrive in Italy, either they manage to arrive autonomously um, or they are rescued by the Italian Coast Guard. But the legislation targets only NGOs, which says quite a lot. Um, and so that's where we have the main point of, of being allowed to do only one rescue. Um, and also in the last few months, every time we are assigned a port, we are assigned ports that are um, hundreds of kilometers away from the area where we would normally disembark people. So this is adding several days um, to our journey with survivors on board, but also as we then want to return to the search and rescue area to, to do our work, it takes us more, like we lose time, I think is the, is the correct way of saying it, because every day that we are not in the area where normally we do rescues, people risk um, to lose their lives, people also risk um, to be intercepted by Libyan Coast Guard, which are to this day still supported by the European Union, by the Italian government. Um, and people who are intercepted by the Libyan Coast Guard will be returned to Libya. They will be returned to detention centers. They will be abused. They will be extorted. They are essentially returned back to the hell that they are trying to flee. Um, and indeed, so and this I has... Sorry, go ahead. 
Yes, I, I wanted to ask you, in terms of those refugees who do make it uh, to Europe alive, uh, what kind of conditions do they face in countries like Italy or Belgium, where you're from? You've also worked in the refugee camps in, in Greece. Could you talk about the conditions that they face? Yeah. Um, so it's been a few years now um, that I was working in Greece, but I think there we, we've seen a very similar, in the end, it's all part of, of a wider European deterrence policy. So basically trying to deter people um, from approaching Europe. Um, the I, I worked in a, in a camp for asylum seekers, an official European camp for asylum seekers on the island of Lesbos. There was space for 3,000 people at its peak. There were 20,000 people there. So you cannot imagine how overcrowded it was in insufficient access to, to um, water and sanitation facilities, insufficient space for people. It became very insecure because of these conditions. Um, and, and at this very day, as a, on, on this very day, as a, as a Belgian citizen, I know that uh, a few kilometers away from my door, there are several asylum seekers uh, who have a right um, to, to access to reception centers by the government, um, are sleeping in freezing temperatures on the street and have been for about six months at this point. Um, so indeed, it's it's what we see happening in, in Italy is, is unfortunately part of a, um, a, a wider policy at, at European um, level that has been going on uh, for, for many years. And I remember when we went to uh, Calais, uh, what was the largest refugee um, uh, camp, and I think all of Europe at the time, uh, called the jungle by the people inside. Um, it looked like the countries that the people were from were um, a map of the countries the United States had bombed, from Afghanistan to Iraq to Syria. Can you talk about who was on this ship? Who died? Um, so the information that we have uh, so far is indeed uh, Afghanistan is for sure a, a country that, that comes forward. Um, Iran is a country that comes out. Um, then there's a few different nationalities that have been named. Um, I've heard Somalia being mentioned as well. I've heard Pakistan being mentioned as well. And I think this is very much in line also with the people um, that, that I've met um, on board of our rescue ship who were coming out of Libya, uh, despite the geographical location of Libya, I met people um, also coming out of Syria. Um, we met people from Afghanistan, from Pakistan, um, and, and the same thing when, when we were um, in the, on the island of Lesbos. Uh, last time I was there, the majority of people arriving uh, were coming from Afghanistan. We have people coming also from Eritrea, from Nigeria. Um, so many people very clearly fleeing um, countries in, in conflict. And then when speaking about the route to people who come through Libya, um, there for sure we also uh, come across people who have moved towards uh, Libya because they don't have any, any like um, economic opportunities in their own countries. So they look for work in Libya, but then they get trapped in this horrendous cycle um, of exploitation, basically, of uh, forced labor. Um, and that's what eventually pushes them to, to leave Libya, where the only way out is indeed taking the sea. And, and um, let it be very clear, in general, people know, understand very well how dangerous it is, um, but which only goes to say how dangerous the places are that they're fleeing from. Um, I think it's the, 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 the cliche that always comes back, but there's a, a reason why it's a cliche, because it's so very true. Like people wouldn't put their children on a boat if, if the sea did not seem like a safer option than the, the place they are fleeing from. Um, I have worked in Afghanistan um, myself. Um, so, yeah, I think at some point you start seeing the whole range of the places that people leave up to the places where people arrive and the, the horrendous welcome that they receive or the, the lack of welcome that they receive. Caroline, we just have 30 seconds. What are you calling for? When is the geobarance, your ship, being released by the Italian government? But go broader than that. Um, we should be released in 15 days. Obviously, we should be released now every single day that we are not there. People might die. People might be returned um, to Libya. We need state-led search and rescue. And most of all, if anything was shown by the drama on Sunday, we need safe passage and safe and legal routes for people fleeing uh, to reach Europe alive.
at the very, very least. Caroline Willeman, we want to thank you for being with us. Deputy Head of the Mission for Search and Rescue at MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières, that's Doctors Without Borders, speaking to us from Brussels. Next up, we go to the oral arguments Tuesday in two cases challenging Biden's student debt forgiveness program. Stay with us. Black Gold by Chicago's own Charles Stepney. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. The Supreme Court heard oral arguments Tuesday in two challenges to the Biden administration's student debt relief plan, which could give tens of millions of federal borrowers up to $20,000 of relief each. Outside the court, activists rallied. These lawsuits are bogus, literally backed by right-wing billionaires. Look it up, rich people who've happily accepted government handouts in the form of having their PPP loans forgiven or receiving government subsidies. Does the government work for them or does it work for us? That's my question. Okay, so if you ask me now what it feels like to be $120,000 in student loan debt, I say it feels like solidarity. It feels like power. If one person owes the bank, that's not one person's problem. But when a million people owe the bank, that's the bank's problem. That's Maddie Clifford of the Debt Collective. Supporters of student debt relief were joined by lawmakers, including Independent Senator Bernie Sanders, who called education a human right and said public colleges and universities should be tuition-free. In America, you should not have to face financial ruin because you want a damn education. Inside the Supreme Court, several conservative justices expressed skepticism over the Biden student debt relief plan, while liberal Justice Sonia Sotomayor blasted the Republican states who brought one of the suits. There's 50 million students who are uh, will benefit from this, who today will struggle. Many of them don't have assets sufficient to bail them out after the pandemic. They don't have friends or families or others who can help them make these payments. The evidence is clear that many of them will have to default. Their financial situation will be even worse, because once you default, the hardship on you is exponentially greater. You can't get credit. You're going to pay higher prices for things. They are going to continue to suffer from this pandemic in a way that the general population doesn't. And what you're saying is, now we're going to give judges the right to decide how much aid to give them. That's Justice Sonia Sotomayor Tuesday. Before we're joined by our next guest, I want to play a clip from a video produced by a more perfect union about a group funding the lawsuits against student debt relief called the Jobs Creators Network. The same billionaires and corporations that don't want you to have higher wages, that want to bust your unions, that don't want you to have decent and free medical care, that want to dictate what you do with your body, that want more tax cuts for the super rich, they're the ones that also want you to stay neck deep in student debt. For more on all of this, we're joined by Eleni Shermer. 
She organizes with the Debt Collective. She's a writer and postdoctoral fellow at Concordia University's Social Justice Center in Montreal. Her new piece in The New Yorker is headlined How the Government Cancelled Betty Ann's Debts and follows up on her piece last summer, The Aging Student Debtors of America. In an era of declining wages and rising debt, Americans are not aging out of their student loans. They are aging into them. Well. Eleni, welcome to Democracy Now! Why don't you start off by laying out um, the arguments and the cases before the Supreme Court yesterday and the questions that were asked by the Supreme Court justices? Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for having me here. I, I just want to start by saying it's it, it, it's it, we shouldn't take for granted the fact that five years ago, ten years ago, the fact that calling for student debt cancellation was wildly ludicrous. And yesterday, we saw the solicitor general, general representing the Department of Justice and the Biden administration arguing tooth and nail for the right for these loans to be canceled and, and the necessity for these loans to be canceled. So that's just the, the big picture framing of what happened yesterday, is that we even got to this point is just a fundamental testament to the, the strength of the movement. Um, yesterday, what happened at the Supreme Court was that they were hearing two cases. One was brought by six Republican attorney generals who were suing the Biden administration um, because of the claim that entities in their states will lose money if student debt um, debts become canceled. The other one was brought by uh, two plaintiffs from Texas who are suing the program um, because they believe they were not they were either excluded from getting relief or not getting the full amount of relief. So instead of petitioning to expand uh, and increase the debt relief program, they they were suing to to halt the whole thing. And could you could you talk about the um, this issue of uh, that you wrote about in one uh, in a New Yorker piece, the aging student debtors of America? That you highlight the astonishing fact that there's a, a growing demographic of student debtors that are people over the age of sixty. Yeah, this is. I mean, I as someone who's working in this student debt space. I'm familiar with the understanding of debt as a poverty tax. The people who have the least money end up paying the most. This is how debt functions, basically. But it was really a revelation for me when I understood that people, the fastest growing demographic of student debtors are old people. And it, it, it really sort of shed light on the, the absolute policy failure of, of student debt, that once you take on a loan, it becomes increasingly harder and harder to get out of it. We saw this, you know, one of the, the people that I was lucky enough to, to listen to her story was a 91-year-old woman named Betty Ann, who was worked as a school teacher in Harlem for decades. And at age 55, decided to go back to school. She wanted a, a, a different, a different tool, a different angle on the problems that she was seeing around her. She decided to go to law school in the 80s. At this point, she was one of the first Black women to to attend New York University Law School. And to do this, she had to borrow about $30,000 in the mid 80s. When I spoke to her in 2022, she owed 300, more than $300,000 in debt. Um, and this is just sort of she's one on, I, I, I can she's one of thousands of people who have paid made years and years and years of payments only to find their balances continue to grow um, that the administrative errors on the Department of Education has has put her in worse case um, and that that it's she's she when I spoke to her she was preparing to die with those loans at 91 years old it's hard to imagine how she's going to come up with three hundred and thirty thousand uh, dollars to pay back debt and this is unfortunately all too common as we talk to people who who unfortunately believe that their only way out of their debt is by coffin and her grandson well, Jeremy Flood that's right and her grandson I mean this is this is a it's a it's an intergenerational problem we see um, Betty's Betty has debt. Her grandson has debt. Um, he's one of the the millions of people who applied for relief under President Biden's proposed program this summer to cancel ten to twenty thousand dollars per per debtor of relief. Um, 
And he, along with, you know, millions right now, is waiting to find out what's going to happen, if he's going to be able to, you know, have enough money to begin to make other plans with his life, to start a family, to, to invest in a house, to save for retirement. These are the kinds of questions that, that, what were, that rest on this policy. What, what will people be able to do with the rest of their lives? And when you mentioned uh, Biden's announcement last year, the um, you've raised a point that the administration uh, it made a mistake in not having an application to apply for debt relief ready at the very time that they had made the announcement. Could you talk about that? Right. Right. So, you know, probably the first mistake actually was was from my point of view and my colleague's point of view was was needing an application to begin with. It wasn't, they, it was, there were proposals uh, that were floated prior to Biden uh, for, for debt to be automatically and universally eliminated, which would mean that everybody who has student debt would get their debt canceled. This was not the path that President Biden took. Uh, although, you know, there was a whole, the weeks before the, the Biden's announcement, it, basically every group representing civil society, labor unions, the NAACP, advocacy groups, attorney generals were, were pushing the Biden administration to cancel this debt automatically and universally. And the Biden administration, for unclear reasons, chose not to take that path. They wanted to, to implement the relief with means testing to make sure that the right debtors <laughs> were, were getting relief. And by right, they were, they were trying to peg it at a certain income threshold. So they picked the number of $125,000. If you make it $125,000 or less, you're eligible for ten dollars to $20,000 of relief. This was the program that they announced in, at the end of August. But also, for unclear reasons, upon announcing this program, they did not have an application ready to go, fired for people to fill out. And it took almost six weeks for an application to become ready. They, re they rolled out this application on a Friday, a Friday afternoon, which, you know, as in the news world or the, you know, that's a, that's a bad time to roll out anything, a Friday afternoon. But within hours, millions of people had applied. And what's more, the people who applied were the, 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 the from the, some of the poorest uh, places in the country, right? The, the new analysis of the, those who applied for relief, the average per capita income of the person who applied for relief is less than $35,000. So there's this sort of notion that, that debt relief, canceling student debt is a giveaway to the wealthy. Most people who applied for student debt relief are making under $35,000 a year. Oh. Um, but so, so back to the question about the delay in between in those six weeks between President Biden's announcement of the policy and actually rolling out the, the application, that was a fatal six weeks. In that time, half a dozen right wing lawsuits were filed to, to, to challenge the entire program. And four of these suits have been dismissed, but two of them played the game very strategically, and they were able to, to find plaintiffs and that, that were going to advance this the claims to halt the whole program. And more importantly, they were able to find sympathetic Republican Trump appointed judges who were willing to hear what a lot of legal experts consider to be just laughable claims um, to, for, to bring a suit, which in legal terms is called to have standing. Um, so that's sort of the moment that that's that's how we got to this moment right right now. I want to go to Chief Justice John Roberts speaking during the oral arguments uh, for the Department of Education versus Myra Brown. Since we're dealing uh, in, a, in a case with individual borrowers or would-be borrowers, I, I think it uh, appropriate to consider um, some of the fairness arguments. Uh, you know, you have a, two situations. Both two kids come out of high school. They can't afford college. One takes a loan, uh, and the other says, well, I'm going to, you know, try my hand at setting up a lawn care service. Um, uh, and he takes out a bank loan uh, for that. Uh, at the end of four years, we know statistically that the uh, person with the college degree is going to do significantly financially better over the course of uh, life than the person without. Um, and then along comes the government and tells that person, uh, you don't have to pay your loan. Uh, nobody's telling the uh, person who is trying to set up the lawn service business that he doesn't have to pay his loan. He still does, uh, even though uh, his tax dollars are going to support the forgiveness of the loan uh, for the, uh, the college graduate, who's now going to make a lot more than him uh, over the course of his lifetime. 
So that was Chief Justice John Roberts. Interestingly, the federal government has, in fact, forgiven loans for lawn care companies and many other types of companies. According to federal records, a company called Tough Lawn Service in Norwalk, Connecticut, had a $358,760 loan forgiven for money it received through the PPP, Paycheck Protection Program. And that's only one example. Um, so if you could address this, Eleni, and also overall, I mean, there's very few people who object to the GI Bill, where so many people um, who served in various wartime situations ha um, went to college, and that was considered a very good thing, supported by the federal government. Is it that, over time, the color, the complexion of the borrowers has changed, and that's why there are questions being asked right now? I mean, I think that's a really important question. I, I, I don't think it's a massive coincidence that the same session that the Supreme Court is hearing the, the cases about student debt relief, they will also potentially bring an end to, to race-conscious admissions and affirmative action programs and higher education admissions. So the question of, of what co who will be able to go to college and what financial burdens uh, will follow them is, is really central to the, the Supreme Court's session right now. Um, you know, as, as to the issue of fairness, this, you know, what would be... I, it's, this was a... I, I found this to be a humorous part of the exchange yesterday. As, as the, the claims around what's fair, it would be fair if college was free for everybody so we didn't have to try to pit one struggling worker against another struggling worker and who's making the better gamble <laughs> of how to make, make their way to health insurance, to, to uh, you know, a job that will provide health insurance, a job that maybe will provide some sick time if they get ill. I mean, these are, these are the kinds of questions when people decide to go to college, they're not generally trying to, this isn't a get rich quick scheme. This is a chance to try to figure out how can I contribute to my society? How can I, how can I provide for myself? What's going to be my path to be able to, to have a meaningful, a meaningful wage um, that gives me a little bit of job protections? And right now, you know, the decline of the labor movement, uh, the, the erosion of labor rights has basically routed that path through higher education. Uh, if we had it, 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 we could have a very different situations for how people could get access to dignified wages, to, to um, you know, secure jobs that provided health insurance, pensions, benefits. Uh, we didn't set up the, the, this is not the economy that we're living under. This, this is, we kind of, we, we route that, those kinds of social welfare provisions. I'm, I'm in Canada right now, and, and you don't need to go to college to get health care here in Canada. This is a perfectly, there could be other arrangements on the table. That's not what we're working with. So. <laughs> Uh, Eleni, I, I wanted to ask you. Perhaps just have Justice a, Roberts just, is a bit. Yeah, Eleni, we just have about 30 seconds, but I just want to ask you one other question. The reference of Chief Justice Roberts in that clip that we just played to uh, getting a, a, a college education, graduating from a four-year college, uh, do, we, do we have any data on the percentage of these loans that are basically, you know, these fly-by-night for-profit schools that for everything from beautician programs promising the, the 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 students a career that never panned out or that they never graduated from college? What percentage of the loans are represented by that uh, uh, those kinds of uh, uh, outcomes? Um, you know, a, a vast majority of the people who have student debt never graduated from their programs. So I think, you know, that's an important thing to consider. These, the, the fairness question that Justice Roberts is pointing out is it implies that people are making a lot of money off of their degree. And, and we just actually, we know that's actually just not true. A lot of people actually aren't even able to finish their program, perhaps because they have to, the, the, the cost of tuition is so high or the debt loads are so high, they have to take on other jobs to be able to, to pay for education to begin with. Um, so so I, I think, you know, one, the, the sort of the point here, what's fair is for the government who has the, the power to create these loans to begin with, has the power to cancel them if they so choose to, which is the, 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 the basis of, of President Biden's relief program. Eleni Shermer, we want to thank you for being with us, writer and postdoctoral fellow at Concordia University Social Justice Center in Montreal, organizes with the Debt Collective. We'll link to your piece in The New Yorker, How the Government Canceled Betty Ann's Debts and the Aging Student Debtors of America. Uh, next up, we go to Alabama, where hundreds of striking minors are returning to work. At 
at the Warrior Met Coal Company after nearly two years, back in less than 30 seconds. Keep your pity to yourself, bask in your megawatts of wealth. Think nothing of the blood that feeds that wire. See me right there on the news, enduring endless interviews, while I wait here for the glare to expire. And those men in Washington, they cry that something must be done. Poor old souls to keep us safe and well. Overhead in private jets, they ain't done nothing for us yet. As we toil in a black and sooty hell. I hear workers overhead trying to reach us forward. Coal Miner's Song by the Poxy Boggards. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. As we end today's show in Alabama, where hundreds of striking miners are set to return to work Thursday at the Warrior Met Coal Company after nearly two years on the picket line. The president of the United Mine Workers of America sent a letter to Warrior Met granting an unconditional offer to return to work on March 2nd as the the two parties continue to negotiate a new contract. For more on the end of the longest strike in the history of Alabama, a so-called right-to-work state with powerful anti-union laws, we're joined in Birmingham by Kim Kelly, independent labor journalist who's covered the Warrior Met strike since it began. Her new piece for The Nation magazine is headlined, Why the Warrior Met Strike is Ending. She's also author of the book Fight Like Hell, The Untold History of American Labor. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Kim. It's it's great to have you with us. Explain what's happening tomorrow and the significance of this longest strike in Alabama history. Thank you so much for having me and for spotlighting these workers' struggle. It's been difficult to get media attention on this strike. But yes, after 23 months, the coal miners of Brookwood, Alabama are heading back to work. Now, March 2nd is the return to work date that President Cecil Roberts gave. It's going to be a long process, though. Uh, the company, I, I acquired a um, a document from the company that expressed some of the conditions that it had for the workers to return. It wants them to get physicals and drug tests and undergo safety training. So it's not all going to happen at once. Not everyone is going to roll down into the mines tomorrow, but the process has begun. And this is in uh, kind of a messy end to what's been a very long and grueling and difficult labor conflict down here in uh, outside Birmingham, Alabama. These miners went on strike back in April 1st, 2021. They voted down a tentative agreement that was reached a few days later. I believe that was April 8th or 9th, and they've been out on strike ever since. It has been a slog, but these miners have held the line. You know, they've been supported by their families, by the local community. It's been incredibly difficult because, as you mentioned, Alabama's a right-to-work state. This is not a union-friendly area. The local, the local judiciary has made it incredibly difficult for them to hold their pickets and to continue the strike. Local law enforcement has made it very clear they are not on the workers' side. The company has been very recalcitrant in the way that it's dealt with the strike. But after 23 months, the decision was made by UMWA leadership that, you know, they had to try a new tactic. The company has not been budging. The company has actually been profiting, even with the skeleton crew of scabs it has been operating with, due to high coal prices. So it's really at kind of a do or die point. As President Roberts mentioned in the letter he sent to uh, Warrior Med CEO, the only people being harmed right now are the miners and their families. And so the union has changed tack, and the strike itself is no longer happening. But the fight continues. They're going to keep fighting out. This, this struggle in uh, negotiations at the bargaining table. And hopefully we're going to finally see some movement because these miners really need a break right now. And could you talk about the company's use of replacement workers uh, and the impact that that had and uh, in their ability to persevere against the, uh, uh, the union in this case? Absolutely. One of the reasons that Warrior Met Coal has been able to remain profitable and productive is the fact that it launched an extensive effort to recruit replacement workers, scabs, from other states. We've seen billboards as far as West Virginia and Kentucky, Tennessee, asking workers, come down here, come work for us, we'll give you benefits, we'll give you bonuses. The people working in the mines right now who are not union, who are replacement workers, they're making $2,000 a month bonuses that the workers whose jobs those rightfully are were never making. Uh, and they, it's, it's a problem because these workers they don't have the experience and the knowledge that the union miners have. You know, they, some of these folks are new to mining. They've worked 
uh, nine months, a year. Some of the folks that are on strike, they've been working in those mines for 20, 30 years. That makes a difference. And the company's been able to exploit the fact that workers need to pay the bills. Coal mining is a complicated industry. There aren't as many decent paying jobs as there used to be. And so people have come down from other states and essentially taken these Alabama workers' jobs, crossed the picket line, and helped to break this strike. Um, as you write about, Warrior Met reported large profits due to um, the mines running the skyrocketing price of coal. Um, uh, can you talk about not only this and what that means, but also what it means to be in Alabama, um, a famously uh, anti-labor state, um, and what this signifies for the country right now? So much of this is sheer bad luck. The miners walked out on April 1st. In June 2021, coal prices skyrocketed. I believe they quadrupled, and that those prices have held. So throughout the entire strike, or even though these workers have been out, they have been running a skeleton crew, they, kind of, the mines have not been at full capacity, the owners have been able to profit because of those coal prices. And the market is not something that workers can control. So it's been a huge issue and a huge reason why the strike's economic impact hasn't been felt the way that the union and the workers wanted it to be. And also the fact that we are in Alabama, which I must say is a state with an incredibly rich labor history and a strong labor movement, but a very, very anti-union state government. It's a right-to-work state, which weakens the movement. Uh, as, as I mentioned, law enforcement has been very clear about whose side they're on in this conflict and have turned a blind eye to violence on the picket line. And Alabama itself, the, there's something that happens a lot when we talk about the Deep South, places like Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana, where I think there's an impulse for folks to write them off. It's like, okay, well, we're not gonna be able to pull anything off here anyway. There's no point. But there is, and there are so many people who have been fighting here for centuries, whether we're talking about the mine mill workers decades ago, or the sharecroppers that Robin D.G. Kelly highlighted in his book, Hammer and Ho, or the Amazon workers down the street in Bessemer two years ago that launched the first effort to unionize an Amazon warehouse in this country. There is a labor movement here. There are workers here, but they need more support. They need better laws. They need better politicians and officials to actually support them, because this shows what happens when workers are abandoned by the people that are supposed to advocate for them and supposed to protect them. They're hung out to dry and left at the mercy of a Wall Street venture capital-backed company that sees nothing but dollar signs when it looks at them. And we've only got about a minute left, but I wanted to ask you precisely about the lack of support, either uh, focusing on this strike by the national media or national politicians, uh, 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 especially given the fact that the Biden administration claims to be so pro-labor. Uh, there were no major political figures uh, coming to uh, Alabama to walk the picket line or focus on the strike. The workers here have felt abandoned, and basically the issue with this strike is that these are a group of multiracial, multigender, rural, blue-collar union workers in Alabama. The Republicans know that they're a union, so they don't care about them, and Democrats see them as a lost cause, because many of them are conservative. It's a more culturally and politically conservative group of workers, so they think, oh, well, it's not worth our time. But they are. This should have been the biggest labor story in the country for the past two years. And it wasn't. And I think that says a lot about the biases and prejudices and partisan nonsense that dictate whose stories get covered and whose don't. Kim, we just have 20 seconds. But the issue of conversion, moving away from coal, and how workers are included in that discussion. Yeah, that is a big question for 20 seconds. But one thing I want to mention about these workers specifically, they mine metallurgical coal, which is not involved in the energy economy. It's used to make steel. If we went to a green economy tomorrow, these workers would still be heading down into the pits, and that coal, that met coal, would still be shipped overseas to industrialized countries. It's complicated, but the thing I want to impress listeners with is that we need to look after workers, even if we don't like the jobs they're doing. Solidarity means solidarity. And we need to work this out together as we move forward, because we can't afford to leave people behind. Kim Kelly, we want to thank you so much for being with us, independent labor journalist. We're going to link to your piece in The Nation, Why the Warrior Met Strike is Ending, her book, Fight Like Hell. I'm Amy Goodman, with Juan Gonzalez.